Today, we welcome author, speaker, and CEO Ocean Robbins, co-founder of Food Revolution Network, which is committed to inspiring and advocating for healthy, ethical, and sustainable food for all through education about plant-powered foods. Ocean is a passionate advocate for real, healthy, fair trade, sustainable, and plant-strong food. We're also joined by the transplanter, Rafaela Crevoche, an expert in compost, regenerative agriculture, and sustainable soil management. So please welcome Ocean Robbins. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all for being here. I see 411 people with us live right now and all from all around the world. Um, thank you for caring. Thank you for being interested in growing food and what that can do for you, for your loved ones, and for your world. So excited to be here. And I'm so honored to be hosted in this event by Green America. Um, I've been a fan of Green America's for about 30 years now. And it's just super meaningful to get to work together in bringing this message to everybody here. So I wanna talk a little bit now about why I'm such a fan of gardening. Now I um, actually grew up in a one room log cabin in the middle of the woods in British Columbia, Canada. And in my early years, my parents grew most of their own food. And uh, of course I didn't do a lot of the growing. I did some of the eating though, but I remember crawling around when I was barely able to walk. And I remember, um, being in the garden, acting like I was a deer, thinking that if I could like eat kale right off the plant, that would be really cool. And I remember trying to do that and it was so fun. And I think there's like a childlike innocence that can develop when we grow food because there's something so primal and basic about it. We're in direct relationship with the earth and the plants and the, the ecosystems around us. And that is powerful. And, and one of, I think, the great crises of the modern world is a sense of disconnection that so many of us live with. Disconnection from our own nature, disconnection from the earth and life itself, a feeling of living in some kind of an artificial made up environment. And I think that part of what we need in reclaiming our humanity is to deepen our sense of place Oh, I'm seeing a message that says, can ALCL interpreter come back on the screen, please? I'm wondering if something has happened that- Oh, I that... pinned you, Tina. Let's just make sure we've got that because we don't want to miss the yeah, thank ASL you. for those who need that. Um, Tina, do you have a suggestion here? I I did pin you. I, I, I think, so I'm not sure what's going on. Yep, I'm seeing- Tina as well. Um, but of course, we're having a different experience. Other people are seeing her. Okay. Well, maybe we're good. Okay. All right. All, All right. people see her. Okay. That's good. We don't need more comments. We'll carry on and, and hopefully that will work. Maybe click on gallery view um, if you're not able to see her, Patricia. Okay. So anyways, back to gardening. I think that gardening is one of the things that can help us reclaim our sense of place in the world. And there are so many other wonderful things about it. Let me just rattle off a few. One is self-reliance. The industrial agricultural system that provides most of our food is inherently unstable. In the last few generations, we've depleted some of the richest topsoil deposits in the world. We've resorted to using synthetic fertilizers and toxic pesticides and herbicides to keep productivity high, but we are running out of soil, of water, and of space on which to grow the food to feed our communities. And we're dependent on increasingly complicated and long supply chains. When you grow food yourself, you reclaim your self-reliance, your capacity to grow food, kind of no matter what happens in the world. And I know back in 2020, when so many things were chaotic with the pandemic, people who had gardens felt a lot more secure when the grocery store shelves were starting to run empty. You never know what the future is gonna be. Having a sense of control over your family's food supply can be incredibly reassuring and it could make a world of difference at some point. Number two is a sense of purpose. You know, so many of us can wonder whether what we do really matters in the world. When you're growing food, you know it matters. When you plant and tend a garden to feed yourself and your loved ones, you are directly participating in the web of life and you can feel 
that the reality, uh, the, the tangible, certain reality that what you are doing is bearing fruit. Number three is to learn a new skill. Gardening is challenging, it's growthful, and it gives you an opportunity. I, yes, I said growthful, that was a pun, but it was also true. It gives you an opportunity to challenge yourself and discover more about yourself. And that, that learning is good for your brain and your neurological well-being. Number four is cleaner and safer food. Because the truth is that we all hear it's good to think globally and act locally. Well, you can't get a lot more local or global than the food on your plate. When you get locally growing food, the fresher, the better, you're participating in contributing to a more local resilient economy. And you're also connecting to a slower, more settled, more core nourishment experience for yourself. And growing food is the most powerful way to get local that you can have and to get fresh that you can have. And it's also a wonderful way to ensure that you're not going to be exposed to neurotoxic pesticides. You're not going to be exposed to all of the herbicides and all of the toxins that are in the environment out there because you never know even organic farmers exactly what they're doing and there are some folks who cut corners in ways that you might not want to participate in and bring that into your body. Number five is you get more fruits and veggies in your diet. Studies show that when people grow more vegetables they eat more vegetables and they're healthier because of it. We all know we need to eat more vegetables. Well growing vegetables in your own backyard is an incredible way to do that and there's something really special about a ripe heirloom tomato or freshly picked kale or a cucumber salad with cucumbers you harvested yourself. And some of the foods that you can grow in your own backyard garden might not be things that would transport well, but that doesn't mean they aren't delicious. In fact, they may be sweeter and juicier and have more flavor. You can grow exactly what you love. So there's an incredible opportunity when you grow fruits and veggies to increase your culinary delight and the nourishment you take into your body. Number six is reducing your risk of chronic disease because the science is super clear that eating more whole plant foods can lower your risk of cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, obesity, type two diabetes, and even Alzheimer's. It's very compelling we need to eat more fruits and vegetables. Well, when you grow more vegetables and eat more vegetables, you may very well be healthier. But here's the other piece of this is that you are also going to get exercise, which also brings down your risk of chronic disease because exercise is something that's super important in our health lives. And the, the cool thing is if you go to the gym, you may work out with certain weights and do certain things that are good. But in the garden, you're getting all kinds of core strength built and all kinds of functional exercise, which can be some of the best kind for your health. Number seven is reducing your grocery bill. We all know that fruits and vegetables can be expensive sometimes. When you grow them yourself, you have a degree of control. Now, let's be real about it. Sometimes gardens can be expensive too, but they don't have to be. There's ways to grow a garden, if you're, if you're concerned about money, ways to grow gardens that are pretty economical. And at the end of the day, you can save loads of money when you grow food yourself, especially things like tomatoes and zucchini and other foods that that are best fresh and that you can grow in real abundance in your garden. Number eight is you can avoid virus contaminated food and even you can avoid contamination with various pathogens. A lot of big industrial farms use fertilizers that are either chemical or that are coming from manure from factory farms. And sometimes that runoff from factory farms, can't, that when that, that manure spreads around, it can create dangers. And so the wonderful thing about growing food yourself is that you're steering clear of all that because you can choose what you fertilize your garden with and you don't have to put factory farm excrement on there. Um, number nine is you get outside. We all need our vitamin D. We all need time to be in the great outdoors. It's nourishing for body, heart, and soul. And gardening will pull you out there and give you a sense of connection to life. And so those are some of my favorite reasons to grow a garden. There are lots more. Go ahead, if you like, in the chat and share some of your favorite reasons to uh, grow food. Why, if you are gardening, why do you love gardening? If you're not gardening, then... Um, oh, somebody is asking whether I said culinary delight. <laughs> well, that is a good chemical, a, 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 good, uh, a good pun. 
Yes, your colon does delight when you eat lots of vegetables. But let's hear why people like gardening. Okay, we've got no chemicals. We've got community. Great way to connect with the community to ensure the purest and safest greens and the best flavors to know what I'm eating. Mental health. Yes. Let me touch on that for a second. There's a lot of therapeutic benefit to growing food. It can get, be a way to get out aggression. It can way, get, be a way to process things. It's I, I don't know about anyone else, but for me, when I garden, when I put in some time, I feel better afterwards. Okay, there's, there's also exercise, better and fresher food, no chemicals, calming, family togetherness. Sorry, I just realized I'm probably going a little too fast <laughs> for the interpreter. Heirloom seeds. I love to see nature in action. Trudy said it's also a spiritual experience. We're hearing peaceful and happy, enhancing the microbiome, can listen to the birds. Yes, about the microbiome, when you get your hands in the soil, you're actually creating more diversity of a life on your body. See, the microbiome is technically not inside of our bodies. It's right at the borderline between what is us and what isn't us. So what's going through your whole digestive tract is what we often think of as the microbiome, all the bacteria that live in there, but it's also your skin. And so touching the soil and get those little teeny tiny bits of healthy soil that might even end up making their way into your body enhances the microbial diversity in your body. And that's super, super healthy. Okay, lots more people sharing what they love about gardening. Thank you all so much. No GMOs I'm seeing, that's right. Being able to share pre fresh produce with friends and family connecting. And yes, community gardening can be wonderful as well. It's a beautiful thing. You can have friends over and y'all just do a little gardening before you have dinner. Super sweet. Okay, so what are you going to grow? Let's talk about that for a minute. We'll get into that a little bit more. And Raphael is going to talk us a little, talk with us a little bit about how to get growing. But let's talk a little bit right now about some of my favorite superfoods that are super healthy that you can grow in your backyard. And I want to start with alliums. Alliums are onions and leeks and chives and garlic. And the allium family is super, super healthy. So one of the great things about alliums is that they're loaded with antioxidants like quercetin, which can have applications in treating chronic disease. They can slow tumor growth. It's been shown to be effective with colon cancer, bladder infections, reducing blood pressure, and promoting prostate health. It's also a natural antihistamine. And then don't forget about other flavonoids like glutathione, known as the mother of all antioxidants, which is promoted by, it's promoted by flavonoids that are found in garlic and onions, leeks and chives. It's essential for every cell in your body and it boosts your immune system, it protects your heart and it helps remove toxins. So alliums are also very heart healthy for your heart. They have been shown to help prevent blood clots, lower triglyceride levels, prevent plaque buildup in your arteries, and they've got antioxidant properties. Garlic in particular has been shown to lower blood pressure in people with hypertension. Onions may help increase HDL or good cholesterol, especially when you eat them raw. And then they also have antimicrobial properties especially helping to protect against even multi-drug resistant strains of E. coli, candida, and intestinal parasites and viruses. This is especially interesting because our antibiotics are becoming increasingly ineffective because we have this prevalence of antibiotic resistant bacteria spreading all around the world. Well, now we're finding that garlic juice is effective against E. coli and Staphylococcus which are two bacteria that are commonly found in hospital settings. And so this is a great potential use for them in the future. Alliums have been shown to help prevent cancer. There was a 2011 meta-analysis, which found that people who ate large amounts of alliums had lower risk of gastric cancer. And we've also seen benefits of alliums with other kinds of cancer, including intestinal cancer, esophageal cancer, prostate cancer, and breast cancer. Alliums are anti-inflammatory. They're great for bringing down inflammation in the body, and they also have anti-aging effects. So a lot to love about alliums. And by the way, one of the cool things about growing them in a garden is that they actually tend to deter pests. 
So you can dot them around in your garden as a companion plant with some of the other things you grow and they'll help less pests come into your garden overall. So a lot to love about the Allium family. Now let's talk a little bit about carrots. Carrots are a great one that you can grow in a lot of different, in different ecosystems and carrots have incredible health benefits. They're sweet, yes. They're delicious, yes. They also may support eye health. They're high in carotenoids, beta carotene. They also are high in lutein and zeaxanthin, which are known to help protect your eyes. They've been found in studies to help address macular degeneration and to prevent cataracts. So a lot to love about carrots for eye health. They also may have anti-cancer benefits. There was a 2014 study which found that eating carrots is associated with a significantly decreased risk of prostate cancer. And um, it's also been shown to be beneficial for many other cancers. In fact, in one 2018 meta-analysis of 10 different studies involving 13,000 breast cancer patients, researchers found that eating carrots was associated with lower risk of breast cancer across the board. And it also has been shown, carrots have also been shown to reduce risk of stomach cancer. Carrots are also good in supporting immune health. The beta carotene and other carotenoids that are in carrots help support the normal function of your immune system. And they're high in vitamin C, which is a natural antioxidant that's also helpful for immune health. And they may support cardiovascular health. A uh, tremendous amount of research on this actually. Um, and uh, there's been uh, also studies showing they're good for blood pressure control, uh, excuse me, blood sugar control. Even though carrots are sweet, they could also be helpful for people with type two diabetes, likely because of their high carotenoid content. So uh, lots of great things to love about carrots. And now I wanna jump to um, one of my all time favorite vegetables, possibly one of the most nutrient loaded foods on the planet, cabbage. So cabbage is incredibly nutrient dense. Kale gets a lot of attention, right? So do collards for good reason. But cabbage is every bit as nutritious. It's more affordable. And I think we could all enjoy cabbage a lot more and be the healthier for it. And it's pretty easy to grow in the garden. So what are some of the health benefits of cabbage? Well. Cabbage also has anti-cancer activity. Um, and it also has been found to support liver health, gut health. It's loaded with beneficial fibers that are good for your butt, for your gut, <laughs> maybe good for your butt too, but good for your gut. And one of the cool things about cabbage is it can be used in kimchi and sauerkraut, which are even a whole other level because now you're adding not just the amazingness of cabbage, but you're also all adding all the anti-inflammatory and immune supportive ingredients that go in there, including the incredible probiotics that are so good for your gut microbiome. It helps regulate blood sugar. It's good for heart health. It's anti-inflammatory. So much to love about cabbage. And one of the other things about cabbage is that it is loaded with the compounds that your body needs to make the antioxidant sulforaphane. So forafane is one of the most potent anti-cancer compounds in the world. And it's specifically made when you chew raw cabbage and you get it from kale and bok choy and broccoli sprouts and broccoli as well. It's in all cruciferous vegetables, but cabbage has a lot. And just a little bit of the raw, even mixed in with cooked, gives you the myrosinase, which is the enzyme that you need for your body to produce sulforaphane. So there's glucosinolates in there and there's myrosinase in there. And the myrosinase is only present when the cabbage is raw. If you get just a little bit of raw, you get your myrosinase. When the myrosinase is combined with glucosinolates in your mouth, it produces sulforaphane. Sulforaphane is incredibly good for your health. I'm so sorry, those are a few of my repeat. favorite backyard veggies. There are so many other wonderful things you can grow. And now let's talk a little bit about how we can grow these amazing foods. Let's talk about gardening. Robin, I'm sorry, Ocean Robins. Can you repeat the two, um, the cabbage, the raw cabbage gives you two, I'm sorry, I didn't oh, catch those. Yeah, two. yeah, sorry. So it gives you myrosinase. Thank you. The name of a enzyme. And then glucosinolates. Thank you. Yeah, okay. 
Okay, so let's talk about gardening. Emma, do you want to introduce Rafaela? Yes, thank you so much. All right, Rafaela is going to help us uh, shift over to talking about how to grow these wonderful foods in our own yards. So Rafaela, take it away. Hi, everybody. Uh, let me just share my screen because I have a I have a visual presentation. Uh, okay. Am I doing this right, Emma? Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's me. I'm the transplanter. I'm a certified crop advisor and a certified professional horticulturist. So I hope those credentials will help. Um, now, uh, how come we're not? It looks like you just stopped sharing by accident. Can you try again? Okay, stop sharing. Oh, the window closed. Okay, so I have to open it up again. There we go. Uh, this is how you all know this is real and live, folks. <laughs> yeah, funny. it's real and live. It sure is. Let me just not get too confused. We can see your screen now. It's just not in presentation mode. Right. I need to find the presentation mode. Do you? No. Okay. Oh. Uh, let me try it again. Oh, uh, bear with me just a moment, guys. Okay. So um, there we go. No, there it is. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, hey, hey Rafaela, Rafaela, yeah, I've got yeah. it. So I'm going to share it? my screen and you yes, tell me when yes, the same slides. Yes, please. How do I do that? You should be able to Okay, see good, that. good. All right. And uh, how do I move it to the next? You're not. You're going to tell me when to move it. Okay, move it. <laughs> there we go. All right, so here we are, March 11th. Now, uh, go to the next slide, please. Okay, so uh, I, I, this all needs to be put into context. Thank you, Ocean. You really gave a, a terrific presentation. Um, but there's something that we need to keep in mind. We're in a crisis. I, I don't like to uh, traumatize everyone. We've got enough crises going on right now. We've got climate change. We've got wars all over the place. We've got every kind of, of uh, intractable situation that uh, challenges us. But the fact is that uh, much of the world's, of the globe's soil is severely degraded. And uh, the the uh, Food and Agriculture Associate Organization of the United Nations is predicting that 90% of the Earth's soil will be degraded by 2050. Now, this is happening in a very subtle way. It's not something that uh, is hitting us over the head like climate change is. It doesn't uh, show up as big storms or big climate events. It's very subtle, but we're losing and have been losing an estimated 75 billion tons of soil annually. That's that's adding up. Most of that soil in the in the United States, much of that ends up in the Gulf of Mexico, where it's not helping anybody doing anything. So this is all a result of the uh, the so-called uh, advent of modern agriculture, which is dependent on industrial fertilizers, toxic pesticides, fungicides, and above all, disruptive tillage. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so. Uh, uh, this is what this is what happens, and this has been the demise 
of many civilizations. They, uh, you know, the, in Mesopotamia, in Easter Island, all over the world, uh, civilizations got started. They mismanaged their soil. They were going strong for a long time. And gradually, they just, they just couldn't function anymore. That's going to happen to us if we don't make some radical changes in the near future. So what can you do as a gardener? I mean, you know, you, you can't manage those thousands of acres of, uh, of big ranches in the Midwest and the West, but you can do something for your own, for yourself in your own backyard. You can, as, as Ocean pointed out, you can be a gardener and you can enjoy a robust mini ecosystem in your own backyard. Next slide, please. So uh, uh, one of the uh, results of, of this degradation of soil is a, is a loss of nutrition. Now, this is very important. Uh, these, this is an example of wheat and rice, uh, which is a pretty, uh, pretty representative sample of what's happening globally. Uh, they both lost much of their nutrition in the last 50 years. This is a study from India, and India was very famous for the Green Revolution, which took place in the 60s and early 70s, uh, which was uh, headed by a guy named Norman Borlaug, who was hailed as the savior of agriculture. But now uh, we're seeing the results of that. Lots of soil degradation, degradation people with cancer in those villages, it's it hasn't worked out as advertised so okay so uh what do we do well the point is that uh whether you, whether it's a carrot or an allium or any of the or the or a cabbage you don't really know whether it's it has optimal nutrition unless either you've grown it yourself or you know the grower because if you're depending on supermarket uh, uh, provenance, uh, there's there's no telling. Supermarkets, supermarket food, a cabbage in a supermarket environment has probably been in, tr in transit on a few trucks over a course of at least a couple of weeks. And it just doesn't have the, the, uh, the nutrition that it, you'd expect it to even if it was grown properly. And we don't know whether it was grown properly. If it was grown in soils that are comparable to these, uh, to, to the, the wheat and rice shown in the slides, they started out at a big disadvantage. Start, next slide, please. So that's the produce industry. Uh, you know, they do a great job but we have to understand this is a very limited exercise. Even under the best of circumstances, the nutrition isn't what you really want it to be. Because the moment you, from the moment you pick it, the clock starts ticking. And if it's ticking for day, for, it's, it's one thing if you pick it in your garden and it ticks for an hour. It's something very different if it ticks on for days and weeks you're going to lose nutrition. Another thing about the supermarket uh, 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 offerings is that many of the best varieties in supermarkets uh, are not, many of the best varieties available are not for sale in supermarkets. Take, uh, to, take cherry tomatoes, for example. You might find one or two or three varieties of cherry tomatoes in a supermarket. But if you open a seed catalog, you will find hundreds, hundreds to choose from. That is a horse of a different color. You can pick what you want. And uh, there are many criteria by which to pick. They can, uh, they, it can be uh, related to vitamin content or to flavor or to any number of criteria. Let's go to the next slide, please. So, okay, so let's get back to the garden. Healthy soil. 
Healthy soil makes healthy plants. Well, what is healthy soil? Why is it so important? Well, the, the most uh, uh, significant feature of a healthy soil is that it hosts multi-trillions of microbes, fungi, bacteria, nematodes, protozoa, earthworms, et cetera, et cetera. It's too numerous to count. A teaspoon of, of healthy soil generally contains between 100 million and a billion bacteria. Wrap your head around that. Because we, we look at soil and we just see dirt. We don't know. We can't see this stuff. But it is just absolutely overflowing with life. And that life is very consequential for the health of plants. Now, uh, soil health and human health are very closely related. Uh, in terms of soil health, we talk of the soil microbiome, which is that massive population of diverse microbes. In terms of human health, we talk of the human microbiome that oceans refer to, uh, which is also a, uh, it's an a aggregation of, of uh, 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 microbiota uh, that actually keeps us healthy. So uh, what we eat is what we become in a certain sense. It's not, it's not that kind of uh, direct relationship, but there is a relationship. Next slide, please. So what is soil health? Well, there's a little chart from the USDA. Um, and these are some of the main features that characterize soil health. One is the optimized presence of living roots. If we leave living roots in the ground after, after harvest, and certainly during harvest, they are performing a function. They're keeping the microbes alive and flourishing. Uh, another uh, very critical uh, feature of soil health is no-till. No-till has gotten a lot of publicity recently, and it, it, uh, it offers a unique opportunity. You know, in, in, uh, in the forest environment, mature old growth forests, there are massive networks of fungal my mycelia below the ground. And these mycelia allow the trees to communicate with each other and to feed each other, to move nutrients from one tree to another, from one species to another. It does marvelous things. Now, that's not been available in agriculture for the last 10,000 years. Why? because we till, this has been our habit. We till, we go in, we till the soil every spring and we rip up the soil, rip up those mycelium, they don't have a chance to make it. But now that no-till is becoming a thing in agriculture, uh, we are allowing those networks of mycelia to reestablish themselves. Now in your garden, it's not just about no-till because you're really not tilling much anyway, but it's about no, no no till, no dig, and no pull. Don't pull your plants out when your tomato is it has expired and you've harvested everything. Don't pull it out by the roots. Just cut it off at the top at the level of the soil. Leave those roots in the soil. They're very important. And then we want to maximize soil cover. We can do that with a mulch, and that's called that a layer of rotting material that's left on top of the soil is called the detritosphere. It's just a, a, a zone of rotting material, and that's very beneficial for the soil. It's keeping the upper layers of the soil from drying out. It's adding organic matter, and it's giving, uh, it's giving food to uh, many of your, uh, of your microbiota, including earthworms. And then finally, uh, biodiversity is a key factor. You know, diversity is, is uh, the key to balance in almost any endeavor. And in agriculture, it is of great importance. And uh, uh, in terms of the garden, there's no need to have the old style formal garden of a row, rows, a row of this and a row of that and a row of that. You can mix it up. 
it's really good for all of all the plants it it helps everything to to have a community of uh, uh, of species in a in a in a given garden bed next one please so how do we how do we get there well let's let's just recap no till no dig no pull in your garden Keep your soil surface, the term is that's commonly used is armored at all time. Use mulch and use cover crops. And I'll talk a little bit more about cover crops in a minute. Biodiversity is very important. It just just to refer to that. Uh, keeping the living roots uh, alive at all times. And then don't use any of those industrial inputs. We, there's no need. There's no 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 benefit from from uh, synthetic fertilizer, not from insecticides, which kill will all in, inevitably kill more than just you want to kill. They'll kill all kinds of things, and that will disrupt the ecological balance. And no fungicides, uh, nearly as bad as insecticides in the garden context. And then uh, uh, promote animal integration. And there's your there's your um, uh, your ladybug population, as an example of that, we really uh, need to do whatever we can to to uh, influence the uh, proliferation of these insects. Next slide, please. Uh, I think you missed one. There we are. Gardening at home. Yeah. Uh, so uh, by gardening at home, uh, we can we can solve the problem of gradual and immediate nutrition loss because we're going to we're going to eat it right away even if it's a few hours it's it it's not comparable to the nutrition loss in a supermarket environment which will be days probably weeks um, cuz so, some of these uh, some of these nutrients are lost very quickly such as vitamin C and uh, well-managed garden soil will produce nutritionally dense veggies. Next slide, please. Now, biodiversity. There's a. I love this shot. This is from a garden I had a couple of years ago, and uh, it looks like chaos, but it's not. And all of those, the diversity of plants are all helping one one another. Some of them uh, may be. Uh, uh, well, look, they're they're all uh, uh, nutritionally variable. They they're taking different things out of the soil. Some have uh, insect uh, repellent properties that are helping their companion plants. So uh, it's it's it, this isn't maybe the most aesthetically appealing uh, uh, presentation, but it's effective. Biodiversity really counts, and there's a lot of ways to go about it. Next slide, please. Now, soil aggregation, that's a, a photo of Ray Archuleta. Ray is the iconic re soil regenerative expert in the, in the country, and he's showing what aggregated soil looks like. And aggregated soil doesn't just happen. It, it happens under the right circumstances. And the right circumstances uh, include, uh, start with roots and mycelia exuding, exuding sticky substances that glue particles of organic matter and minerals together into soil aggregates. You can see in that photo that that's not just uh, loose soil. Those are aggregates. And what the aggregates do is they create strong infiltration of water. That's very important. Uh, it, it, they, they will perform beautifully in flood situations. When other fields are flooded and have had massive erosion, they, they're able to infiltrate big quantities of water in short periods of time. So it, and it also creates resilience against droughts. It holds a lot of water. And uh, uh, drought situations are less severe with well-aggregated soil. 
and it it also prevents erosion just because it's holding all this stuff together it doesn't tend to blow away it doesn't tend to uh, to 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 uh, wash away uh, it creates pore spaces in the soil and that allows important circulation of oxygen you know plant roots need oxygen too so you've got to have this kind of airy structured um, situation in a soil to optimize your your garden situation and uh, it also creates abundant habitat for for microbes next slide please and Rafaela, just so you know like well, you got like four minutes left to uh, that's all i need okay okay so um uh so we're 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 looking at tillage and uh there's there's listed on the right side some of the benefits of of uh, no tillage uh we we really don't it, this has no role in our garden it's just destroying habitat so uh tillage tillage and uh pulling out plants by the roots no dig no pull no no till this is the new rule. Next slide, please. Then there's cover crops. Cover crops are uh, grasses and legumes that are just planted to either protect the soil or and or to add organic matter back to the soil. It's a great thing to use. You can do it wh when you're cropping certain crops, but they're, they're most uh, appropriately applied in situations where you want to take a break. You've got, let's say you've got a bed that's, that you've been growing plants in for three years. You want to give it a break, plant the cover crops, let that run for a year. It restores and revives your soil. Next slide, please. And then uh, enriching your soil with industrial, without industrial chemicals can be, be done with compost. This is an example of high quality manure based thermophilic compost. You can acquire this in near most big cities. There are compost yards that make this stuff professionally. It's very high quality. It's probably better than any, anything you're able to do at home. So I would urge you to look into that as as your your uh, main source of fertility. Next slide. So that's it. Pretty much that's the the basic outline of how we can uh, uh, address the soil crisis in our backyards. And I, I wish you luck, and I, I encourage you all to to uh, follow the uh, subsequent Green America Climate Victory Garden uh, presentations. We'll be going into detail into some of these procedures and how you can do it at home. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility and abundant opportunity. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Rafaela. Um, let's get into some Q&A. Ocean, if you're able to join us back on camera. Um, folks, feel free to keep sending those questions in through the chat. Um, all right. Uh, we had some some a lot of questions, Ocean, about how does cooking affect the health qualities in different foods, um, alliums were asked about in particular. Yeah, cool. So um, with alliums, well, cooking in general, like there are some nutrients that are more bioavailable or more abundant cooked and some raw. So really it seems that it's, you can do well with both. With alliums in specific, there are specific compounds, sulfur compounds found in alliums that are most plentiful raw. Um, what we have learned, though, is that if you're going to cook garlic or onions, chop them and let them sit or mat or with garlic, you know, you may actually kind of press it and let it sit for at least five minutes before you cook it. 
And somehow the sulfur compounds settle during that time and then they don't dissipate as much when they're cooked. Um, now, personally, I like the taste of cooked onions a little better than raw onions. But if you can learn to enjoy the raw even a little bit, know that you're getting extra health benefits. And it seems that with cruciferous vegetables, as I mentioned earlier, sulforaphane is also more readily produced from raw, but you just need a little bit. So if you shred like a tablespoon of cabbage on a bowl of steamed kale or cabbage or other cruciferous veggies, you'll get your myrosinase, which enables your body to make the sulforaphane, even if the rest is cooked. Um, and then with other vegetables, and some of the nutrients that are found in cruciferous veggies too, you actually do better cooked. So it's all the, probably the biggest principle is whatever way you will eat them is the best because they're so healthy for you. Are there questions? Thank you. Yep. 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 All right. Um, Rafaela, we had a couple of questions about pests. And um, I'd first like to mention to folks, if if you have a lot of questions about pests in the garden, we have a full webinar on Green America's YouTube channel that Rafaela presented on. Uh, but for now, Rafaela, could you tell us a little bit about the best way to keep out unwanted pests? Um, and then more specifically, if someone had some pest issues last year, is it okay to use that same soil this year? Okay, I'll take it one one at a time. First of all, the the whole concept of uh, uh, the popular concept of pest control had had been based on wiping out entire populations. This was the uh, the approach of of the entomologists back in the fifties and sixties, and it led to the uh, to the indiscriminate use of chemicals like. DDT, and that led to Rachel Carson's publication of Silent Spring when she exposed the whole thing, and it's a fraud. And one thing we can learn from that is that we shouldn't try, don't try to wipe out every pest in your garden. It's not going to happen. You won't succeed. It's not worth the effort. But what we can do is try to affect a balance in the pest populations. That we can do through biodiversity, and we can also use certain biologicals to control our, our, uh, our, our pest populations. Uh, there, are, uh, there are a number of, uh, of, of, of biologicals that can be used on occasion to limit the penetration of, your, of pests into your garden. Uh, and uh, beyond that, there is uh, there is also the opportunity to manage your beneficials. Make sure that your ladybug population is thriving, that you have some praying mantises in the garden, that there are dragonflies around and about. A lot of these things will will appear just spontaneously when you do everything else that, that we're talking about in your garden, when you're doing things like uh, uh, promoting biodiversity, for example. Uh, and the second question, what did I, did I, there was a second part to that question, wasn't there? Uh, just if soils that had pests in the previous- Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that really varies on, on the specific pest. There are some soils that absolutely need to be uh, handled with care and uh, with special treatment uh, after being uh, in, infested with certain pests. But in general, no, it's not an issue. Great. Ocean, Jay Eisen asks if there are hints, tips, and recipes available for retaining the nutrients as best as we can for our meals. Oh my goodness. Um, hints, tips, and recipes. You know, if you eat nutritious food, that's great. Don't deep fry it. Um, you know, steaming's good. Boiling's not quite as good because you get a lot of nutrients lost in the water, unless you're going to drink the stock water, in which case that's fine, like in a soup. Um, raw is great. Uh, stir frying can be fine. 
try to go a little light on the oil so you're not making a fried food. Um, but, you know, the best way, I, like I said earlier, the best way to prepare vegetables is the way that gets you to eat them. So have at it. Enjoy. Yes, there are a lot of great recipes. We have a book, Real Superfoods, that just came out. It's a cookbook. A lot of you probably have heard of it. Um, Everyday Ingredients to Elevate Your Health. And it's about the, what we call the real superfoods, which are super healthy and super nutritious and super affordable and super accessible. And the recipes are super delicious. So, uh, but there are so many good recipes out there. You can find them, just find ways to enjoy loving foods that love you back. That's wonderful. Um, folks, I'm putting a link in the chat right now for that book that Ocean just mentioned. All right. Uh, Rafaela, Mary Lee asks if mixing up species in the garden precludes needing to rotate crops. Yeah, it does in a way. It, it really does. Because the uh, crop rotation, really crop rotation uh, has important applications in large scale ap agriculture where they they have to they have to grow things uh, in uh, in quantity without interruption. They, in other words, they can't use the biodiversity. You have the option in a garden, in a small garden, to do whatever you want. So you don't need to apply those those methods uh, of uh, uh, th that that uh, are really earmarked for the uh, large scale operations. Great, thank you. Um, Ocean, someone was curious whether juicing vegetables helps you get all the nutrients from them. Well, you get some nutrients uh, in a, a kind of a flood when you juice vegetables, because think about how long it would take you to like chaw, to, to chomp down a carrot. And then you think about the mm -hmm. fact that when you drink a cup of carrot juice, which you could probably do faster than you could eat one carrot, you're going to be getting the juice of maybe like eight carrots, right? So high volume of certain nutrients, but you're also losing the fiber. Um, so the fiber is really helpful and important. And most of that is is the pulp that gets discarded with juicing. So there's pros and cons. Um, personally, I'm more of a fan of blending if I want to get a lot in quickly um, to make a, a kind of green smoothie. But uh, there are certain nutrients that you can get in a lot of abundance with juicing. One word of caution is to make sure it's not too sweet because you can, you know, fruit juice is actually not super healthy because it's a, it's a somewhat processed food. When you take out that pulp, it can spike blood sugar. And the same is true even with carrot juice. Um, but if you're talking about juicing like cabbage, that's pretty intense. <laughs> so <laughs> good luck uh, enjoying it. But uh, yeah, you probably get some things that are pretty awesome out of it. And yeah, you can use the pulp for, for baking muffins. That's true, Betty says. Um, and there are other things you can do with it. You can make it into flour. Yeah, it, it's it's fun for sure if you'll actually use it. Um, and uh, you can do both. You can juice and steam and chop and munch. <laughs> it's Variety all good. Is the spice of life. <laughs> yes. Um, I'll I'll note to everyone here if you have not checked out all of the recipes on Food Revolution Network's website, they're great. There are so many great recipes to choose from, including smoothies if that's your jam. Uh, so you can you can go there and get some inspiration. Um, all right, uh, Rafaela. There's been a few questions about using garden boxes, both directly on the ground or if they're raised up in the air to standing level. Uh, do you have to swap out the soil? How do you keep the soil healthy in garden boxes? Garden boxes, are you talking about raised beds? Raised beds, yeah. That's raised it. beds, yeah. Well, raised beds are, are a great, they're a great innovation. And uh, they've really, really swept the garden world and I strongly recommend them. The the uh, the con the standard raised bed has no floor on it. It it, uh, it it's built right over the soil, and your soil that you add interacts with the soil. Now I'm going to I I have a controversial, somewhat controversial proposal that I've been using for years successfully, 
and I would encourage uh, gardeners to, to consider this as an option. We fill our raised beds with 100% of this manure-based thermophilic compost. And uh, there are, there are uh, many horticulturists who will say, or there are some anyway, who will say, you can't do that. Uh, I had a friend who's uh, a retired horticulture teacher come over, tell me, you know, she said that exactly that to me. You can't do that. I had her look at my garden. She said, well, I guess you can. It does work. And what it does is deliver to your, to your garden soil 100% organic matter. Now, the normal high-performing high, high, uh, garden soil might have five, six, seven percent organic matter, this is a, a big difference, and it makes a big difference. So that that would be my recommendation. Uh, you, you know, you can you can go to uh, various uh, intermediate formulations. You could do 50 percent, but uh, uh, you, you really need to uh, to take advantage of the opportunity to maximize the organic matter in your soil. Thanks, Rafaela. All right, I have a quick question for both of you before I close things out. Uh, what is your favorite vegetable to eat? Mine's cabbage. <laughs> awesome, good choice, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> I hear cabbage is becoming like a social media sensation. It's like a trending word right now. That's kind oh. of exciting. I never thought I'd live to see that day. It's always kind of in the forgotten. <laughs> yeah, there's cabbage. Like there's other vegetables that are more like glorified as like rock stars, but cabbage has always been kind of taken for granted. I think it's pretty awesome. Um, but I'm going to go with, oh my gosh, there's so many. I've been really liking jicama lately and it might oh. be partly because I learned about its incredible gut health benefits. It's loaded with a particular kind of prebiotic fiber that's great for your microbiome. Um, but it's kind of sweet. It's almost like a little bit like an apple, but it's also got a little more starch and substance and it's great in salads. It's fun just sliced uh, yeah. with a, possibly a little spices on it. You can get really creative. Um, but yeah, jicama is my new favorite fun vegetable. I like to dip it in hummus. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's like it's juicy and it's sweet and, and it's crispy at crunchy. the same time. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So good. <laughs> How about you, Rafaela? I love artichokes. And oh. I, you know, I, I think it's maybe because uh, eating them is so challenging. You, there's so much interaction with the vegetable as you're eating the artichoke. You've got, it, it's kind of this uh, micro involvement with, with the product. And it, it just, uh, it, it works for me. Wonderful. I, I actually, I live in um, California. We are right near the artichoke capital of the world. So we have a lot of artichokes here. I do think some people dip it in so much mayonnaise that they're calorically, they're mostly getting mayonnaise or some <laughs> kind of sauce. And, yeah. and the artichoke is almost like a spoon. <laughs> I see that a lot in restaurants, but yeah. I actually eat artichokes. I steam them and just eat them. I don't actually even eat any seasoning, and I think they're amazing. Yeah. All right. Oh. Oh, people are asking again how you spell the vegetable I was talking about. I was talking about jicama. J i c a m a is the vegetable I was referring to. All right. Oh man, I'm. I'm feeling really positive and inspired and uh, really excited to do some cooking and gardening this spring. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, 458 of you stayed on past the hour to continue this conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ocean, for joining us and Rafaela for coming in as our gardening expert. Um, this has been really fun. Uh, so I want to I want to thank all of you for joining us today and being a part of Green America's Climate Victory Gardens community. Together, we can make a real difference in creating positive change for our planet and people. You can keep the momentum going and stay connected by subscribing to our newsletter to remain informed about our latest campaign events and sustainability tips. Brooke's going to put that link in the chat. Uh, your support fuels our work toward a greener, fairer future. 
again, webinars like this are possible because of your all support. Uh, so consider donating today to help us continue our vital programs. Every, every contribution counts. Remember, your actions matter, and together we can build a more sustainable and just world. Thank you for your commitment to creating positive change, and we look forward to seeing you at future events. Uh, Emma, yeah. can I just uh, add something? Uh, I see a lot, there's quite a few questions in the chat uh, column that uh, we didn't get to. And if you have a question that you'd like to answer, feel free to, uh, my my email address is, is on the presentation. Just uh, just get in touch with with any any uh, issues that uh, that we didn't get to today. Yes, thank you. Uh, I will send around Rafaela's presentation with the recording. So. Oh, fantastic! And I just want to say um, <clears throat> that for those of you who want to support a good cause, Green America is a very very good cause. So please consider supporting their wonderful work. They're they're the real deal, helping us all build a healthier future, uh, starting in our own backyards. Thank, Thank you all you. so much for joining us. Thank you, Roshan. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Tina, for joining as well. I really appreciate you. Blessings on your day, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.